I'm proud to say that I am a tech geek. I graduated as a computer science and applied maths uh, student, and I've been in the industry for the last 30 years. In the beginning of my career, the computing power that I was exposed to would be in these big, huge computers that probably fill up the full hall of today. But it will not come close to the computing power that you have in your smartphones right now. And I was privileged to have been there during the waves of innovation that has come through the industry. I was there when uh, Bill Gates uh, brought in uh, the, a PC on every desktop, which then moved computing power from centralized to what was then called distributed computing. And I was also um, there when the internet came to fore, and then there was this talk about um, distributed computing going to ubiquitous computing. And I was there when the first smartphone came into play. In fact, it wasn't called a smartphone then. It was called a portable phone. It was hardly portable because it was this size and that high. And we had to lug it around without even putting it into the handbag. But you know, I have never been as excited and also scared of innovation as I am right now. And the reason is because disruption through innovation is being redefined. This is what the World Economic Forum has termed as the fourth industrial revolution. Now, each of these buckets of innovation was happening in the cyber world, in the area of 3D printing, data analytics, Internet of Things, are by themselves such powerful, disruptive forces. But you combine them with the power and the innovation that is coming in the physical world, in the area of material sciences and biosciences, and you put this together, and they're working together, plus being enabled by the almighty Internet, where this innovation will become mainstream at a pace that has been unprecedented. Just think about this. It took to, to go to a 50 million user, which means going mainstream. It took the telephone 75 years, but it took Facebook only 3.5 years. And anybody can guess how long it took Pokemon Go to, do, to go to 50 million users, only 19 days. But within these buckets of innovation, the one that is going to have the most profound impact and that will touch the lives of every single thing, every one is going to be artificial intelligence. As I call it, AI is becoming mainstream, fast and furious. Now, why is this so? After all, we've been talking about AI for the last 50 years. For the last 50 years. Why is, what is it that has brought AI from the realms of imagination to the realms of reality that we are in right now? Now, of course, one big factor is the scale of computing power. But the more significant impact is really what is the foundation and the fundamentals of AI, which is data. There will not be the revolution of AI if there had not been the revolution of big data. 85% of the world's uh, data has been produced only in the last two years. Now, let me illustrate to you how uh, data is really the foundation of AI and machine learning. Now, I will not, you'll be relieved to know that I have oversimplified this perhaps, maybe relieved and disappointed perhaps, that I will not even touch on the concepts of neur uh, neural networks. But I will just illustrate in this very simple way. Because AI is about simulating the intelligence of humans. Now, if you think about it, how do we develop into our intelligence as babies? We would look at, in this particular case, we would look at a puppy and we look at a donut. And over time, we'll be able to then create rules in our brains to say that a puppy looks a certain way and a donut looks a certain way. And as we see more puppies and we see more donuts, we are now able to then realize that with more precision and faster, we, where is a donut and where is a puppy? Similarly, if you see a dog and a mop, 
you're able to then simulate that in your mind. And over time, you'll be able to be more accurate. This is what is called machine learning and image recognition. Now, the difference is with machines, we can do this, or machines can do this at a, at a gazillion times faster. So if you give it a task which is very repetitive and very sequential, an example is in a simple game called Finding Willy. It is able to do this with such speed as it gets more intelligent in being able to find Willy. Give it more data and wham, it's going to be even more accurate as it learns. Now, this is in cases of repetitive and sequential, which is pretty obvious. There's also another realm on the scenario of this if, then. If this, then what? And this is how artificial intelligence and machine learning is now being applied to build up the various, to simulate the various scenarios around if and when. Now, in, in our world, in the, in, the, in the community of AI, there was a historic, almost historic moment that happened in the late 2016. And this was when the intelligence of machine was brought up to a different level. And this was the point where a company, deep learning, a company, its AI system or AI uh, algorithm beat the world's champion in this very complex and sophisticated chess, a uh, uh, board game, much more complicated than chess, called Go. And that stumped the community. Because how AlphaGo is the algorithm from deep learning, how it did this was really to look at thousands of past games and simulate it. Simulate how games were won and how games were lost. And while it has done that, it now plays against itself. And how it does this is this way. And every move, every scenario is being simulated with that kind of speed and that kind of precision. And every move that he has learned is kept with a high level of accuracy. And you know what? Right now, even as we speak, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of software engineers and programmers who are building this kind of algorithms into everything, into every aspect of our life, into various applications. And I, for one, being somebody in the industry, look with excitement. And there's a certain buzz about what is happening right now in the world of AI. But then I look around me, outside of this community, and I am concerned that there is this level of distance and the level of aloofness, this level of, okay, it's either exciting or doom. So there is not engagement from the wider audience outside of this small circle of AI community, and that concerns me. And I, I will pick you back, and this, I was going through some old uh, archives, and I came across this. I want to share this with you. We're going to take down memory lane a little bit, like 100 years. But remember this, you know, in the 1900s, they were talking about horses versus motor carriages. Dispense with a horse. It was still a question at that time. Horses to horsepower. And they were questioned about away with the whip. And these are questions. People were talking about this, whether or not motor cars are going to go in play and how fast and how much will motor cars take over horses. We know what happened. We know what happened. Not very, in not too distant future of then, we know that this was what happened, cars, and until today, and we know how it played out over the years. Now, in AI, similarly, you cannot open up a magazine or a paper without, without looking at people talking about AI. Is it going to augment or is it going to replace humans, the impact of AI on talent? So we, all of us, beyond the community, has been a community of AI and tech people, we have to be very, very uh, invested into what's going to happen. Now, nobody knows what's really going to happen over the next five years, 10 years. But in a way, we have lived through this AI evolution through, through our movies and through our storybooks from the 
warm and empathetic undertones of a she cyborg to this cruel and taking over the world type of uh, 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 overlords. We have played it out. But what will happen? How will AI take its form and shape? It will really depend on humans. And like any innovation that humans have come forward with over the years, the motivation behind it stays the same. And the motivation of humans will always be around good, profit, and power. So good, we know that AI is now being used to predict or to, to assist in the diagnostic of cancer to a higher degree of precision and accuracy that are able to save lives. In the area of profit, we know how much money is being pumped into startups. They are focusing on AI. And in the area of power, as Vladimir Putin has said it, the country that dominates AI will dominate the world. And there are forces out there that is talking about AI for good. How do we unleash the power and the, 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 the potential of AI to solve the problems of the world from, from the environmental sustainability to poverty, solving poverty? And I am sure there are also more sinister forces that is lurking, not being very vocal about it, just talking about how do you use AI for power and for for, uh, for bad. So if we were to discuss the multiple scenarios of AI, the potential, the opportunity, and uh, the implications that come with it, I'm sure we're not going to be able to leave this room in the next couple of days. But I want to leave you with just one element of it. And this element is about, because it intrigues me, and also it's, it's it's scary to me. And it's about the what and the who and the how of AI in decision making. And to illustrate this, let me just share with you, on a, uh, this topic is widely discussed in the area of autonomous cars. So this autonomous car is driving in the middle of the night and um, it sees on the left-hand side an old man stooping. And it sees on the right-hand side a little boy with a ball. Now, what's important is that in the area of computer vision and image processing, there must be accuracy to say that that is indeed a man, an old man and not a tree, and that is actually a boy and not a fire hydrant. So that is, about, that is the area of technology. Now, what I want to talk about is more around a dog crosses the road. Now, of course, it has to recognize that that is indeed a dog and not a you know, a ball that is being thrown onto the middle of the road. But the, the bigger question is, what do you decide? Do you just go and ram the dog, swerve to the left and hurt the man, or swerve to the right and hurt the boy? Now, this is very similar to the trolley problem. The trolley problem, if you, have, if you recall, it is about, it has been played out over the last many decades. You know, you see a runaway trolley, and if it continues, it will kill one person, but if you press a lever that you have access to, uh, well, if, if it continues, it's going to uh, kill four people that is, on its, that is in its way. But if you have a lever and you switch the, on the lever, it's going to swerve and only hurt one person. So what do you do? That is the trolley problem. And this is where you rely on human values. And you can say that it's in the spur of the moment, split-second decision, and whatever they decide, it is under duress. Now, the 21st century version of the trolley problem is that you have to make that decision now because you have to teach that. You have to teach the car what it should do. You have to create the rules and the parameters of what the car should do. And that is the dilemma. Who is making this decision? Who are the people authorized to make the, the, this decision? What is the transparency of the decisions that is being embedded into the car? Because the issue is that the biasness, the prejudice, and the ethics and the values of human beings will then be embedded into artificial intelligence. There must be that level of transparency. We hear a lot about how AI is being used to do job matching. Now, and how it does that is First of all, it has to then look into past data. Now, if the data is already flawed with biasness, 
biasness against gender, biasness against racial composition. Now that bias will be embedded into the AI and will be amplified. And if there's no transparency, it's just going to go unquestioned. Now, even more so if the person who is writing the rules, who is doing the programming, also has another level of prejudice and bias. It's going to be a double whammy. So this is what we need to do. We have to have this conversation and we cannot just rely on governments and policy makers and a few elite groups and the, te and the technology companies to make this decision. You and I, as mothers, as future leaders, we have to weigh in, we have to lean in and make sure that we are able to have a say and define the future for our people. I, for one, will be looking in and be weighing in with excitement as a technology person, as a tech geek, but I will also be looking at this and weighing in with optimism, but also with caution without my tech hat. So with that, thank you.